Cool. So the first talk we have is by Sven Cattell, data scientist at Endgame, and he's here to talk about adversarial patches. Uh, let's go to the beginning. So basically, the plan for this talk was I was going to make t-shirts with adversarial patches, and the volunteer t-shirts all have this stuff. The problem is, um, I tried for about two months to do this, and eventually it just it's not working so well. Um, and I'm going to talk about how to make these patches, how they work, why the thing, and then like reasons for things. So, uh, so I'm a data scientist at Endgame. <coughs> We've already heard about me. Uh, so uh, that's just what we're going to be doing today. So the background of adversarial examples, you've got two things, basic classes of adversarial examples. One where you modify the pixels coming in for images. Uh, you modify the pixels. Uh, of an image so that a classifier screws up. So this is the classic thing where you've got a fast screening side method attack, or you trick saliency, or various different types of attack. And we most, I hope most of us have seen Ian's panda, where he misclassifies it as a given with some noise. Um, these sorts of attacks are good for understanding how neural deep learning works, but they don't act, they aren't actually attacks. They can't do anything in the real world because you'd have to grab the input out, the output of the uh, camera and modify the pixels on the fly, and it would, you know, it's not a realistic attack because it would require more hardware computation than you probably can get into a system. The other type of attack against machine learning is the physical modification. So what you can do is you put a set of stickers on a object and have it misclassified. So one of the first papers that did this was the one with, um, they were attacking the uh, classifier that do stop signs because, you know, self-driving cars, so stop signs, and they came up with a way of producing um, pixel modifications that they can put as stickers on the stop sign and cause the, 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 the classifier to get misclassified, you know, work badly. Um, there's some evidence that their attack does not work very well in real life, and um, you have to have a weak a poor classifier and a few other things to make it look like it works. Um, but these sorts of attacks are much harder to do. So adversarial stickers are the second type of attack. You actually can put a thing on a person and have a thing. Okay? So the way you build the attack is there are three parts of the attack. Uh, so you have the actual sticker. So this is like I built this as a little object um, that contains the uh, image, the floating, the little tensor that holds the sticker. Uh, it also holds a mask, so you can have pics of the sticker be different shapes. Then we have um, a placer that puts the sticker on a bunch of images so that you can train against those images with the classifier. And then we have a trainer that actually does the training process. Um, so it's very easy to build them. Just you've got you're just going to build these three different components. And if you go look at the original paper, there's a link to a GitHub account which has basically these things laid out. So uh, if you get a sticker, um, well, the way I built the sticker is you can take an image, a PNG image with a mask, uh, for a mask, and it can be whatever you want, um, as long as it fits within your training target thing, or you can take a NumPy array, and then randomly initializes the patch around 50% 50, 50 gray with a bit of noise, and that's the start of the sticker. It initializes that. When you call the sticker, it gives you back uh, the tensor for the sticker. This is, I did this in a PyTorch, and it, so you can start applying it to images. And it, it does a few things where it clips it so that the, uh, the sticker is an actual image, so it stays in the, in the pixel range, and then it multiplies it by the mask so that it looks like that mask. An example is we got the patch with the Defcon logo, and but with the, then the mask that produced it, and then we have Endgame logo and the mask that produced it. Um, so this is the simplest component, but like the thing that we're actually training. Yeah, this is the, the core, the, the, the rest is decorations around this. The, probably the most, the most important component is the placer. So what this does is you can take, you give three ranges, so a range of uh, rotations that you're allowing, so anything, any rotation in this range, so plus or minus 15 degrees, 30 degrees, a range of uh, translations you're allowing, and a range of scaling that you're allowing. So you can scale it up by 30% or down by 30% or whatever, and you randomly select it. When you call it, what this does is it makes samples a bunch of affine transformations with those 
within the ranges you've provided. Um, copy the sticker into as much as many images you, as you have, and then transform the, 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 those stickers to be the right shape. Also does this with mask, and then applies it to the sticker. So for how it works, so we've got the stickers on the side, and um, the masks on the side, and here is an affine transformation. And so we'll randomly select a S, theta, a T, X, and a T, Y. Um, and I'll select, in this case, 25 of those, and then apply that to each of those stickers. And then you get the, the transformation on the outside. So you see on the left, you have the untransformed stickers, and on the right, you have a bunch of transformed stickers. Um, and so then you have, you store that, and then put a little bit of math, and you apply the stickers to these images, and you get, I'm sorry for the image quality here, um, you get a bunch of stuck images, uh, like stuck images. And that, as that point, you can feed to a classifier. And then we get to the last component, the trainer. This thing you can take in several models to train against. So these will be your white box models that you're training against, your, your attack against. Um, it also takes an optimizer and a few other things you need to do gradient descent. And this thing places the, the models and the stickers on the GPU and does all the stuff, the, the juggling that you don't want to think about. And actually, what it does is just performs the training. So we have a basic train. The basic training loop here is this is for CFAR. So we have our sticker on the uh, left. And so the sticker goes through the placer with some images. And so it gets, it gets placed on the placed on these things. So we have a bunch of 25 images here that have been had a sticker attached to them. Then this goes into a classifier, whatever classifier we have, that uh, the thing, and then we take the loss with respect to our target class. So in this case, I was going for the ninth class, uh, the tenth class of C bar. Um, so we take the loss with respect to what class we're trying to get, and then we do a backprop gradient descent against the original sticker. Because this entire track thing from the original sticker to the loss is smooth is a smooth transformation, so we can do gradient descent with respect to the sticker itself. So this is the basic training loop, and if you wanted to do a single neural network, if you wanted to train it against a single classifier, you just do this, and you're good. Um, but if you wanted to train it against several classifiers, so what happens if you want to train it against two? Well, this uh, you can train it against two by going okay. In my loop, I'm just going to do it twice, basically the same the same basic loop twice. I'm going to have we're going to do the first classifier and then the second classifier, and then I'm going to loop until I get a sticker that works. So this is for an ensemble training against multiple models. And then there's the other way of doing it, which is what you do is you instead of feeding into one classifier, you feed it into two classifiers. You get a loss, add add it up, you take the gradient all the way back, and you get a result. So those two things work, and then you can train up. A classifier, and here we get the result. So if we have, I did this with, like the only thing I could get this working on was CFAR, and there's, uh, we'll happily talk to people about like null results here. So what I did was I got those four models on the side, so a VGG style network with nine layers, VGG with 13 layers, a ResNet with 22, and a, a deep net, which doesn't perform that well with 10 layers, and then we tar I targeted against, okay, uh, I targeted against a ResNet 10, and the graph on the left is for that scale, for the zero scale, we had no performance, so this is a, this would be the image scale down to a point. Obviously, it's not gonna do anything useful, and then for when it's 20, covers 20% 20 of the image, it's kind of useful, and then at about 40% of the image, it kind of, it, saturates the convolutional layers and, and causes misclassification. So for this for this sticker here, you need to cover 40% of the image and then it will cause a misclassifier, misclassification. Um, and you, this was trained with in the sequential model, and then if you train it in parallel, it doesn't perform as well. Um, um, there's reasons for that, but so I went, built this out, tested against CFAR. You know, CFAR was a unit test, and then I went, okay, I'm going to get this working on ImageNet. And so went through the original paper, 
And with CIFAR, you can, like, with this stuff, it was trained with a certain range of rotations, scalings, and translations. And if you take the rotation to be within, with plus or minus 90 degrees, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't train well, it doesn't work. So the, in the original paper, they mentioned, oh, you can do complete rotations, it can be stuck in any orientation, it's fine, uh, it'll work. But what they, when you actually look at their code, they only translate it by plus or minus 15 degrees in that range. Which, well, that's the first thing that I was like, this is a little bit not so good. But so with CIFAR, this thing is with their parameters. And if you go for bigger parameters and more manipulation of the affine transformations, is that curve drops off rapidly um, with more new perturbation. Um, so uh, for these, this is how the, like the GIFs of the training through uh, an ImageNet. Uh, so what I did was I grabbed um, four ImageNet, uh, four ImageNet models of the PyTorch repository. I stuck, I pointed my trainer to train against those four, and it's the same set. Uh, that I trained CIFAR again, so it would be a, uh, a ResNet, ResNet 50, some, uh, two BGGs, and a DeepNet. Uh, so I trained that again against that, and I targeted a uh, ResNet 33 or, BG, uh, or one of the BGGs. Um, and the performance I got out of this was about 10%, 5%. So it doesn't actually function as well as the paper says. The paper that they have says it should work at the same as the slow CIFAR curves and I got a flat curve. Um, I tried, I went back to their paper, they're only using 5,000 examples, they're using models that may or may not, I don't, I don't know what their models look like, could not get the thing to work um, after like two months of things. But, so basically like, welcome to AI Village, uh, we have a novel result. <laughs> Um, so references, like I only use like the original paper, um, and then we've got Ian Panda and Luke the stop sign. So if, uh, if you guys have any questions, yeah. Yeah. I would be able to then do a white box attack, and these were designed to be black box attacks. And it's more effective with white box attacks. Um, I, I, if I wanted this to be a realistic attack against machine learning models, which I should do, and this should be robust enough to be black box. Also, one of the things that makes, that makes the image more robust to train against several models, this was supposed to be an ox. It classifies as a conch shell, but that's partially because of t-shirt printing. So it's not, the t-shirt printing isn't sensitive enough to get the fine details required for this to overwhelm the classifier. So I started this project with like, yeah, these adversarial patches, the looks of the paper look awesome, I'm going to do it, and then end of the project with like, these are not realistic. <laughs> yeah? Uh, I don't remember at this point, I'm tired. Yeah. Um, I know, it might, it could be that I made a mistake somewhere. Uh, yeah. So the code that I wrote is on, up on GitHub, um, and I will be writing a blog post for the AI Village and describing exactly why I think this is an all result, and with all the code, and it's designed to be easily readable so you can see what's going on. Um, but, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Um, Forty percent. Um, you. Uh, well, it becomes. There's a like from making a few thousand of these. I have inclinations to say um, you're going to get situations where so the deeper the network, the more effective the attack. Um, I think it's because it's, it, it can diffuse out more before it gets to the final fully connected layer um, in the combinational layers. Um, yeah. Uh, I think, we, yeah? Oh. Uh, 
uh, I trained it on my desktop that has two 1080 Ti's uh, and like a, a 6700K uh, thing. Um, yeah, I also trained, I actually trained those CFAR things on my razor blade with the 1060. So um, the, the, this architecture, uh, the model parallel architecture is about seven times faster than the sequential thing because you can put it on each, one in each GPU and you don't have to juggle things. Uh, it, so it can train in about half an hour for image against uh, a portion of image. You only want to train it against like maybe 10,000 images. Um, so you don't need to go all the way. Um, also, when you actually go to decide, okay, I'm going to do this, uh, pick a very, very aggressive step size. Uh, so their step size in the paper is five. Um, and I found that if you make that too low, it just stops, it doesn't work. So the, these GIFs were made with a step size of uh, 0.3 to make them pretty and make them actually look like they're doing something. Um, but they're, yeah. Yeah? Uh, you want to try that out? The code is open source on the repo. Um, the, uh, the, art, the, the, so the way I built this was with the, um, the uh, so there's the affine grid transformation in PyTorch, which was designed for uh, spatial sequential networks. So in those, they have a training parameter for, to unperturb the network. So you know how you put an affine transformation on an image to do data augmentation? Uh, so these networks were designed to learn how to undo data augmentation as well as do a classification. So there, the architecture that for them is a, there's a pair of uh, operations in PyTorch that do that step and they take in parameters like that, um, like the, what, what, the scanning thing. So that affine transformation is just a grid transformation and you can feed, it's a smooth transformation, you can feed data into that thing to fix your transformations to be useful. Um, so there's actually a paper for doing it. I, Manipulating the affine transformations. And, uh, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, I would just, if I was a specific network that I was targeting, I'd just do this. I wouldn't try to do ensemble training and stuff. Just focus on that one. No, I wouldn't have to do anything. You might be able to be a bit more aggressive in your training, too. Uh, yes, that's the thing. The when you do this, when you take this, if you allow the rotation to be sampled from within uh, plus or minus 90 degrees, the whole system breaks down. So the rotation that you, is actually effective is plus or minus 30 degrees or 15 degrees. So they already pretty much say these stickers have to be sitting straight up and nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, but they, they learn how to recognize dogs that are upside down. Yeah. Um, 
maybe. Uh, so I tried. Yeah. Sorry. Um. Uh, not a question, but uh, dealing with the VGG22, uh, I think the kernels there are about the three multiply three yeah. matrix. So the scaling is a lower one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, the, so, so the scaling is the receptive field at the bottom is three by three. But then you go up one layer, the receptive field, I think, think when you go all the way back down to the image, is 9 by 9. And then one layer up, it's like 27 by 27. Sorry, it's no, not 9 by 9 by 9. It's 5 by 5 and then 6 by 6. Um, it's, sorry, uh, 7 by 7. So the receptive field for this a pixel at the top of the VGG22 is uh, uh, 3 times, uh, yeah, 22 times 2 plus 1. So it's massive. So this pixel sees a lot. Yeah. Hang on. Um, I wanted to make. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. We also with ResNet. Yeah. And that this, we've tried all sorts of also. You can try it against every architecture. Inception is also one of the ones that you can try against. So. Um, yeah. So I think we're going to be Mark Mager is the next guy. Oh, one quick question, and then um, I don't know whether this is, I'm going to write a blog post and see, and though after that I'll feel if, if I feel like continuing to work on this is fine. But I think we need to move on to our next speaker. So Mark.